Hey guys, welcome back to the CVCS Chapel Podcast. My name is Bianca Moore, the Spiritual Life Prefect on campus. And today we have Eric Williams, a youth pastor from South Shores, coming to speak with us today. Let's listen. Good to be back. Um, last weekend, our youth group sponsored a, a retreat for not just teenage girls, also known as the Stanley Cup Mafia. But the Stanley Cup Mafia, the teenage girls, invited a mentor, a woman, a mother, an aunt with them. And then some invited grandmothers, and we had about 60 women total that get, got away. It was a fan, fantastic weekend. God moved in a big way, but the, all the young teenage girls, high schoolers, middle schools, got together, and they had a Q&A session last weekend, and they were asking really tough questions, and there was one that kept popping to the surface again and again and again, and so I thought we'd deal with that here, and it's an issue that doesn't just affect teenage girls, but it affects teenage boys and adults, frankly, too, because one of the heartbreaking realities of following Jesus, if, if that's you, if you're trying to follow Jesus, is that if you live long enough... Most of you will have friends who you share a common bond with Jesus who will then walk away from their faith. That might be in high school. It might be later. It might be in middle school. But many of you who follow Jesus will have friends who claim to have faith in Jesus, but then something happens and they begin behaving and living and believing like someone who's not a follower of Jesus. So what we're trying to figure out is, what do we do? How, do? how do you live when your friend dips on Jesus? What do you do when you have good, a good friend who just changes, they begin going a different way, but you're still friends? What do you do? Because this has happened to me too. I may be super old, but in my years of following Jesus, I've had close, close friends who once shared with me a real love for Jesus who now no longer believe. They live a godless life. Some of them are quiet about it, and some of them now argue with me about why I follow Jesus. And every time it happens, this is painful. So if you, if you want to follow along in your Bible or, or some device, we're going to be in Psalm 55 a little bit. In Psalm 55, King David is sort of brokenhearted because he had this happen to him where he feels a sort of abandonment from somebody he considered a super close friend. And David sort of seems confused, is that, like, why is this happening? Because they had enjoyed a deep connection over their faith in God, and now that connection that was once super tight, it's gone. Let's read what he says, Psalm 55, verse 12. He says, it's not an enemy who insults me, otherwise I could bear it. It's not a foe who rises up against me, otherwise I could hide from him. But it's you, a man who is my peer, my companion and good friend. We used to have close fellowship. We walked with the crowd into the house of God. And David's sort of here mourning his friend, who their, their connection's gone. And that might have happened to some of you, as it has to me. I had close friends that loved Jesus. We had spiritual harmony, so to speak. We talked about our faith. These were friends that we saw the world the same. We had the similar values, the same loyalty to Jesus' commands, the same trust in Jesus for salvation. But then something, some file got corrupted. Something changed in them. Some file was downloaded. And oftentimes, sometimes it was a choice that was made. And oftentimes that choice was a sinful choice that pushed them over the edge away from Jesus. And when that happens, our friendship changed every time. When their faith in Jesus eroded and eventually it disappeared, we had no common ground on the most important issues of life anymore. And if this happens to you, as it probably will at some point, it can be super depressing. It can feel like a loss. It can feel like abandonment really, but I want to let you know you shouldn't be surprised. You should almost expect this 
The Apostle Paul, he gave a warning about this in 1 Timothy 4.1. He wrote, The Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. That sounds heavy duty, and it is. But when we or our friends leave the faith, we're actually chasing lies. We're chasing deception. We're falling into the lies of the enemy. And side note here, friendships are different for guys than they are for girls. Friendships between guys is different than friendships between girls. Because here's what I mean. Guys don't just like text each other and like, hey, let's meet at Starbucks and sit across the table and share a pumpkin spice latte together and look into each other's eyes. They don't do that. For the most part, guys generally form friendships around doing stuff. They form friendships around hobbies or activities. Guys need something to do before they can talk to each other, usually. And when I think about some of my best, closest spiritual friendships, my memory is sort of painful and good at the same time because I have these memories. One of them, we were surfing overhead trail three at San Onofre, just us three. And that never happens. And we had great talks walking up and down the trail. Or the time, a couple years later, when we, we did a 100-mile mountain bike race in Colorado. And we had this deep current connection around the Lord, the spiritual bond. And those shared adventures we have make the loss of a spiritual friend even worse. Because not only will I no longer get to pray with my old friends... But because of this change in my relationship, we're not going to have these activities anymore because it's sort of the relationship's sort of dead. So the question I want to leave you with here today in chapel is, if you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, what do you do when your friend no longer follows Jesus? How is a Christ follower supposed to handle it when your Christian friend no longer wants to follow Jesus and no longer wants to live like a Christian? How does a, how does a Christ-following teenage girl or boy survive when it seems that you're legit alone now? And the Christian friends you thought you had are now living for sin or for pleasure. They're living for anything but Jesus. What do you do? Uh, bad news up front, there's not an easy way to get through this. Just like surviving a 100-mile mountain bike race it's going to hurt a lot at some point before the finish line. And that's sort of like this situation. So I just want to give you a couple little tips for how to help it hurt less or how to survive better if this happens to you. The first one I want to tell you is this. Be chill. And what I mean by that is don't lash out at this friend because of the hurt you're feeling. Because there are some of your friends who stopped following Jesus And the reason for that change, the reason for that difference now in the spiritual allegiance is super complicated. And even though it affects you personally, try not to take it personally. Just chill a little bit. Because you don't know what's going on in them. They might have personal trauma. They might have pain. They might have, their family is just messed up. They might have gone to college and some crazy blue-haired woke college professor just boiled their brain and cooked it. They might have some disappointments in life. They might be having intellectual doubts that they came across on Reddit. Or maybe it's just that heart of stone that Jesus warned of that is tearing down their trust in him. But by far, the most common reason my friends over the history of my life have walked away from Jesus is not any of those reasons. By far, I would say over 90%, The reason my friends have walked away from their faith, I think you know the answer already. They needed slash wanted an excuse to justify the sin they really wanted. Main example that's happened time and time again, they want to sleep with or live with their girlfriend. But God says clearly in his words, sex is reserved for marriage. And they can't get around that. So my friend, over time, comes to a dark and deceptive realization like, aha, I am now 
intellectual. I no longer believe in God. I am enlightened, presto changeo, with God out of the picture. I can do what I want with whoever I want now. And they walk away. So when I say be chill, I'm saying pursue having a compassionate and understanding heart towards a friend who walks away. Jesus in Matthew 9, it said that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We should try to adopt that attitude a little bit because sheep without a shepherd are dumb and confused. And at a minimum, we should be compassionate when our friend stops believing, regardless of the reason, and be chill and keep praying for them. That's the first one. The next one is this, be realistic. Be realistic. If you have a friend who was a Christian, you had fellowship together and they no longer believe, you have to admit to yourself, girls, you can journal about it, guys, just just go to the gym and deal with it. You have to admit that the nature, what your friendship was, it's not the same. And this doesn't mean you'd have to just abandon them necessarily. It does mean that the bond you had through Christ, it's, it's altered. And it needs to be handled differently. And one of the sad things that happens when your friends walk away from Jesus, they'll often pull away from you too. Recognize that. They no longer will feel comfortable around you or me because if you're trying to follow Jesus, your life is centered around Christ and my life's patterns after Jesus' teachings, which they're running from. So whatever the friendship was, it's not the same. Be realistic. Try to accept it. Acknowledge it. Mourn it. Pray about it. Bring it to the Lord. Next one is this. Be hopeful. Be hopeful because sometimes there are people who abandon their faith and they get to the end of the road and they're like, this was a terrible idea. I feel empty, broken. This did not give me what I, was, what I thought it would give me and I recognize that I made a bad decision. That can happen. And that's what you should be praying for weekly. Now, there's some of you smarties in the room who are thinking something. Wait, so you're saying a Christian can, like, lose their salvation and then get saved again? I'm not saying that. I am saying, I'm I'm convinced the Bible teaches that getting saved is a one-time event. and, And if you're actually saved and born again, you'll never abandon the faith. And you can't lose your salvation. But oftentimes, your friends are people who are going through the motions of faith. They're swimming in the waters of Christian faith, but they've never actually surrendered their life to Jesus. They were, they've been forced to go to church their whole life. They've been sent to CVCS their whole life, but they've never given their life personally to Jesus. But being hopeful means remaining a friend where it's possible Asking the Lord that their faith would be recovered for the first time, whatever. And being hopeful means ready to be nice and welcoming if they decide to return. Okay, the last one's this, and it's the darkest before we finish. Be vigilant. Be vigilant. Head on a swivel. Be ready. When you think about a friend of yours who no longer believes, there's a very heavy warning from Scripture to guard our own faith so that it won't catch, we won't catch what happened to our friend. We have to actually protect our faith so that our faith doesn't grow cold. Paul gave a warning to Timothy in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy. He said this, Follow the pattern of the sound words you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Guard it. Why? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I don't mean all, I don't mean with all the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or idolaters, because then you'd have to go out of the world. But I actually wrote to you not to associate with any so called brother if he's an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or swindler. Don't even eat with them. What, What we're trying to realize is that. The people we are close to will influence us. The most dangerous friends to have are friends who claim to be Christian brothers and sisters, but don't live a godly life. Why? Because we naturally drop our guard around people like that when they claim to be Christians. We tend to trust them. Your mom tends to like them. But it also means we're vulnerable 
to being influenced by them if they're not what they appear to be. Okay, so if you have had your headphones on and didn't hear anything today, just I'll leave you with one sentence to remember. Be vigilant, guard your faith in Jesus. You learn a lot at school, but those you learn the most from will be those you are closest to. So keep Jesus the closest and hang on to him. Jesus, we pray to you this morning and ask that you would help strengthen friendships that are here in this room today that are bonded together by your name. And I pray for anyone in this room who's kind of dealing with this pain of their friend walking away from you, and it changes their relationship. Lord Jesus, I pray you'd bring a healing and a restoration, and I pray you'd help every heart in this room to know that there isn't a life to be found better than the life that's found following you. So I pray you'd strengthen these young men and women to pursue you no matter what their friends do. They, they would find a satisfaction in pursuing the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I pray you would strengthen friendships in this room and beyond for years to come. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. My before pleasure. we start, I mean, I know you've been here before, but mm-hmm. just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, I'm still a youth pastor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's, I guess, good about that is I have a front row seat to the lives of young people. Mm-hmm. And we have a small group program. And then in that small group program, volunteer mentors, leaders do life on a even deeper level with students. And so I hear feedback all the time with like, what are the what are the issues that the kids are dealing with? Mm -hmm. And so I like to unpack God's word in a way that helps the students uh, address those issues. So, all right. Um, first question, what do you want everyone to walk away with specifically? I wanted them to leave today knowing the harsh reality that friendships that formed in Jesus ish environments Mm -hmm. like church, school will have bumpy roads and they will have friends who make big decisions and end up walking away from the faith. And so I wanted to give them tools in their toolbox for when that happens Mm -hmm. to know that the relationship's going to change, but that life will go on. Mm -hmm. That's essentially it. Yeah. And I'm very glad that you spoke about this because it's, it's a really sad reality how, um, like high schoolers and even like the statistics Mm -hmm. of how many high schoolers going into college, Mm -hmm. like actually keep their faith is about like 10%, which is so unfortunate. And people tend to forget like, yes, like they're, they're um, like leaving and like Mm -hmm. walking away from their faith, but also the relationships that came with that are also being like messed with as well. So um, a question that I had well, first, I want to talk about you were mentioning like a common question that people can lose their salvation. Mm-hmm. I actually was ha- I was texting my friend Nala about this, mm-hmm. and she sent me a video, and it was this man explaining. It was it was like a weird way of explaining salvation and how mm-hmm. people can lose it and like get it back, but it yeah. was like it was weird, and we both were kind of like iffy about it. And it opened up the question: What really is? salvation Mm -hmm. and can you be saved more than once? And I literally wrote it down. I'm trying to find it, but you said that you are saved one time. So before I answer your question, I don't want to act like a politician uh, (laughs) and, and just like not answer it. There are Jesus loving people Mm -hmm. who don't agree on, on the answer to this question. Okay. Yeah. There are, people who honestly, truly know and love Jesus who disagree. Mm -hmm. So the position that I hold to that I, I I think scripture says is that once someone authentically, truly knows Jesus Mm -hmm. and they are quote unquote saved, that that is something that can't, it it can't be, it can't be nullified. Yeah. Because if if it could be nullified, that means the power of Jesus to save is 
messed with. For sure. Yeah. So I think the conversation goes to what I tried to allude to a little bit in the chapel is we make so many assumptions about what a Christian looks like. Mm -hmm. And even, even our ourselves, as we grow up, we make assumptions about ourselves and what our faith is. Like I've been going to church, I've been going to this church forever. And my, my parents and my grandparents even love Jesus. Of course I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. So I think what is truly saved and how we understand that is sometimes they're very far apart. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's people who have grown up assuming they, they know and follow Jesus, but their heart has been parked somewhere else for a long time, even though their body has been in and around church like places. Yeah. So again, to not answer your question, um, (laughs) (laughs) I, I don't think someone can lose their salvation. Um, and get it back again, mm-hmm. because I don't think you lose it. Because yeah. people who truly know Jesus wouldn't ever walk away from Him. Mm-hmm. Um, so the conversation can get messy after that. Well, what yeah. about people who are struggling? They're struggling with depression and despair, and yeah. they're uh, are, have they lost their salvation? I would say, I would say no. Um, but where I really wanted to leave the kids not on is my friend saved. And, and worrying about that, but mm-hmm. more of when your friend has walked away from Jesus and from you, essentially, what are you going to do? Yeah. And that's where I wanted to leave kids with, well, I hope in, as they deal with the pain of that lost friendship, that they would pull in closer to Jesus, mm-hmm. the the author of their, their salvation and faith. Um, that's where I was hoping to leave them with today because that theological argument is so deep and so it's messy yeah, <laughs> and it's uh, emotional at times. Uh, but I, I just landed in, okay, I'm convinced once you're actually saved, you, that is something that can't be messed with. Mm-hmm. And so my advice follows after that, I guess. Yeah. That's really cool. And so are you saying that once somebody is saved, like from... What I'm getting mm-hmm. from what you're saying, once someone is saved, they are like, it's so incredible that they wouldn't want to go back or, or do they like fully know and understand or were they not saved in the beginning or like what, like. So let's take an example, somebody like Judas. Okay. As a case study. Mm-hmm. Now we don't know, was Judas saved? Is Judas in heaven? Signs point to not looking good. Mm-hmm. And so if we look back and go, okay, was Judas saved Mm -hmm. or was he on the team of disciples with a heart in the wrong place? Mm -hmm. And that's my analogy for what I think is the situation for people who look like they lose their faith. Okay. Is that I don't think they were ever on the team Mm -hmm. or they were on the team for... Not suspicious reasons, but for reasons that don't pull you through the hard times. Oh, yeah. Like um, joining the cross-country team sounds great until you have to run 10 miles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, even if your friends are on the team, mm-hmm. uh, even if you want a varsity jacket, all those things, it's like when it gets hard, that tests motives. Mm-hmm. And so I tend to think that people who walk away from, quote, unquote, their faith, never had an authentic faith. Mm. They were never had that saving connection with Jesus. Mm-hmm. Instead, they they were sitting close to Jesus and his people, but maybe to, to really oversimplify it, because that's where all their friends were. Yeah. And once that girlfriend or boyfriend comes along in 11th grade or sophomore year of college... Mm-hmm. Well, that's not convenient anymore. Yeah. And suddenly their faith isn't convenient to mm-hmm. what the, to the situation they're in. Yeah. And it just all starts to unravel mm-hmm. versus the person who in 11th grade goes through a whole tumultuous season of uh, losing friends to all sorts of different issues when mm-hmm. they stay close to Jesus. And even when it costs them, they stay close to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that get to college and they're not usually rattled because they're the authenticity of their faith has, has, of their faith has already been tested. Yeah. And, and they're in for the right reasons too, Mm -hmm. because if your reason for coming to Jesus is 
fire insurance, escape from hell. Mm -hmm. And not out of an appreciation and a love for who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. That's shaky. If a guy dates a girl because she's amazingly beautiful, Mm -hmm. that's not bad necessarily. (laughs) But if that is the main thing that causes his attraction and commitment to her, as she ages, that's not looking good. Yeah. Because the second law of thermodynamics says that we're all decaying. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And as she hits 50 and 55... Their marriage and their his commitment is going to falter because mm-hmm. it was built on something that flawed is the wrong word. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't enough. It didn't. Yeah. It didn't come with his commitment to her, regardless of her her looks. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's is a, a backwards analogy to go. How is that like our faith? What are the reasons I'm motivated to follow Jesus? Oh, because my friends are there, because I feel good when I'm at church, because when I sing worship songs, I feel better at the time. Um, those are short-term motivators Yeah. versus my jaw is hanging open because I cannot believe that Jesus would offer to forgive my sin because I'm looking at that history of my life and that list is so long and his grace is so good and Oh my goodness, that is a lo- much longer term yeah. um, commitment fuel, mm-hmm. I guess, than than anything else. Yeah, that cleared up pretty much everything that I was confused about. So thank you. And I'm sorry for a little going a little no, bit off great. track there. But, that's good. Um, thank you so much for clearing that up. Um, a question that's more on like what to do mm-hmm. when those close to you kind of like quote unquote, for lack of better words, lose their faith. Right. Um, what would you, so you were talking about being vigilant and also like not associating with them mm-hmm. as much. So are you saying, cause I'm, for me, when I think of somebody, um, kind of like stepping away from their faith, mm-hmm. I, I think, okay, like I want to be there so like I can almost I think, help I them. I think that the clarification for this yeah. is simple. When Paul said don't associate with the immoral, Mm -hmm. A, he was talking about people who are claiming to be Christians. Okay. He wasn't saying non-Christians because he's like, he says, you'd have to like leave the planet. No. He's like, don't associate with people who claim the name of Jesus full faced and then at the same time are doing X, Y, and Z Mm. with enthusiasm. Okay. Paul's like, that's toxic. So you're talking about like lukewarm Christians. I would say even worse than that. Oh. So the the girl who's hooking up with her boyfriend, but is on the worship team at church, is is kind of her small group leader calls her aside and says, Hey, th- you can't be doing this. This is opposed to what Jesus says. This is not the right thing. This is impure. This is immoral. And she's like, I don't care. Mm. That's that, that or some equivalent in any other category yeah. is the one where it's like, whoa, mm-hmm. that that's that's the person that Paul says, hey, that's that's the kind of danger that you should you should avoid. Mm-hmm. And so it's not the people who are doubting mm-hmm. or struggling. The girl that comes to you is like, oh, my boyfriend, things are going so good, and I I really like him. I think I love him, and you're and you give her good counsel on how to handle this in a godly way. And she's like, I don't know. doesn't mean you cut her off and never talk to her again. Okay. It's the, it's the person who is in an unrepentant way mm. living against Jesus while claiming Jesus. Mm. Mm-hmm. Paul says, don't go to Denny's with them. Okay. That's, that's yeah. the person. Okay. And so it's, it's a pretty extreme example. It's the person who is without shame is knowingly living opposed to Jesus while claiming allegiance to Jesus. Mm. Paul says that is, that's super bad. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That helped a lot. So how would one go about like, when we come into contact, like, let's say it's like a family member Mm -hmm. who you're constantly around and they just like, don't 
believe in God. Like yes. they they used to, but then like something happened, and then they're just like completely like sworn against. I it. think the family family member might come in from a different category mm-hmm. and require a little bit more grit and gristle to endure, mm-hmm. because they're while they can't influence you, they're not in the friend category. Yeah. And I think we're able to compartmentalize a little bit with family members. Yeah. Especially like older siblings who've Mm -hmm. uh, walked away. But like they were your mentor when you were nine. Mm -hmm. And now that they're 19 or 24, now they're like off the reservation and they're not following Jesus. And I don't think Paul would give the same command to not associate with them Mm -hmm. at all. Because they're they're your blood. They're your family. Yeah. But I think the the encouragement to be vigilant is when Paul would say, hey, keep in mind. Keep in mind who your Lord is, who their Lord is, mm-hmm. because though that is the lens through which each of you see the world. Mm-hmm. That is the lens through each of you give advice. That's the lens through each of you um, make decisions. Mm-hmm. And so I think if there's somebody who has a close family member who no longer follows Jesus, you treat that like... You treat that like <laughs> this, this might be a very uh, just, out, out there analogy. Just say it. <laughs> if you rescued an abandoned dog, mm-hmm. you don't know you don't know their history. They could be volatile. They could be dangerous. Mm-hmm. You want to help them, but you have to understand that what, as you're helping them, they can be a danger to you. Mm-hmm. That might be the illustration. And that might sound overly harsh with a family member. But what I mean is, as you're talking to this family member, recognize because of the way they're coming at the world, the way they, the advice they give you, it comes with a potential danger, a yeah. potential bite. Yeah. And so you need to be careful. You, you want to feed them, you want to love them, um, play with them, um, whatever. But recognize this is, let's just say a wounded animal. They, they've got stuff in their past that you don't know. Yeah. And that can cause reactions and, and uh, uh, instructions that could be dangerous that mm-hmm. you might need to be vigilant against. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you so much. This is like clearing up a lot. And, Great. And now I'm kind of jumping like all over the place. This was good like... because I asked, um, the, there's a woman that works with, with me who does all the stuff with our girls and she went to this retreat and she was talking nonstop about how much God did. And they had this Q and a session that was just, it went three hours. It was supposed to be one because mm. the girls wouldn't stop asking questions. And I go, Hey, I'm doing chapel on Thursday. Mr. Dill said I could have it be about whatever I wanted. I go, what was the thing? What were the issues and challenges and questions that the girls had? And she's like, far and away, the number one thing was this. Mm. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I think I think that sample size of our church, our um, 20-year-old women and teenage women, that's a good enough sample size to, to be helpful for those at CVCS. Yeah, for so. sure. And I, I think, like me personally, I've, I have a lot of friends who I'm really close with and they're really close with the Lord, but I also have some friends who I'm also very close with mm-hmm. who kind of like are basically matching the description that you yeah. talked about where they like maybe weren't fully in mm-hmm. and then they're just like stepping out. And it's it's a really hard thing to handle because you want to help them. You mm-hmm. want to like save them. But you I also like it's hard to do that. You brought up a good category because the category I kind of approached was that extreme one from Paul of the brother who claims the name of Christ and is boldly without apology, living against Christ. Yeah. You brought up that category earlier, the the lukewarm person, the person who's kind of like they're, they were hot for Jesus, but now they appear to be simmering or mm-hmm. they were never quite hot, but they were interested. But now they're like, I don't know, mm-hmm. because there's all this cool stuff around in the world. I think while being vigilant, it's great to have that attitude you're bringing up of, of wanting to help them. Mm-hmm. And even though your friends kind of pulling the mentor question out sometimes mm-hmm. to be when you're when you're spending time, you're having Starbucks, you're like, hey, are you are you feeling good about the where you're at right now? Mm-hmm. Like asking those meta questions, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like 
and they're like, whoa, I didn't know we were going this deep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in your heart, you wanted to help them to go like, hey, where do you see this going with Steve, Brian? I don't know. It's just fun. Oh, do you think, or do you, how do you, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just wondering what you think. What do you think? How do you think if Jesus has an opinion about your relationship, what do you think his thoughts are? Mm. And that's like, that's good. You're, you're not you're not accusing them of yeah. anything, but you're helping them to go. Hey, where are these classes <clears throat> of Jesus's opinion? What do you think? And that, and it helps them. It can help them, maybe light the fire a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, last question. <laughs> if anyone were to get in contact with you, how would they be able to do that? Uh, Southshores.org. Find mm-hmm. my picture. Send me an email. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, it was an incredible discussion. I really appreciate, Glad to be appreciate here. you coming and speaking okay. with us. And we will see you next week All right, sounds the good. next speaker. This episode has been a production of the Capistrano Valley Christian Schools Podcast Network. Capistrano Valley Christian Schools is a Christian JK-12 school in San Juan Capistrano, California. Be sure to check out, subscribe to, and leave a review of this show and the other shows on our network on your podcast player of choice. Doing so supports the school community in a multitude of ways. For more information about the CVCS Podcast Network or any of our other shows, check out cvcs.org or email podcasts at cvcs.org. On behalf of the whole network, this is Mr. Jasper saying thank you again for listening and stay tuned for more.